Castle's there, Billy did. The goal, Chris Billy Huddersfield Town. The most famous goal of Chris Billy's life. Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. Be in Steve Simonson's boots now. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the frame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Huddersfield Town are promoted. Stephen Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance. Right, welcome back to the Andy Takes That Chance podcast. Happy new season to you all. This week, COVID ravaged its way through the town squad and all of a sudden, what appeared to be a friendly start to proceedings had the potential to turn into nightmare juice. But town swallowed it, got on with it and dodged the bullet of defeat. A good point or a disappointing start? We'll find out from our own rejigged lineup. This week, having spent two years on the Takes That Chance red list, Ollie Fisher is back with us as his status changes back to Amber. You all right, Ollie? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, delighted to be in Amber again. Good. We'll see how this goes before changing afterwards, eh? Mm-hmm. This yeah. past week also saw some young, hungry players head out on loans with the hope that they'll return to stake a place in the first team next season. A man who is always hungry and indeed tends to eat whilst we record, it's Phil Senior. Oh, there he goes. He's eating already. How are you doing, <laughs> Phil? See, I've even preempted good this. Even Very pre-empted. good, thank you. Very yeah. good. Uh, okay, so finally, the world of football was rocked this week. There were tears, sadness, and shock as the biggest free agent in sports history was set to bear his soul to the world and offer himself to the highest bidder. Thankfully, Andy takes that chance, beat off rumoured interest from PSG, and I'm happy to report that Cameron Pope will be popping in with us from time to time this season. How are we doing, Cam? I'm all right, thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me on. No, I couldn't be talking about anyone else at all there at all, could I? <laughs> Right, guys, before we get going, I just want to say thank you to the continued sponsorship from Magic Rock. Uh, Magic Rock now sponsoring the South Stand, which is good for you, Ollie, because you'll be able to buy the town lager in there as well. And, you know, I know you like to get oiled up on a match day, don't you? So what better way to do it than with uh, some Magic Rock in there? Uh, So, yeah, so they're going to be selling lager in the ground or or Craftdale, whichever way you want to look at it. So happy days and more happy days if you use our code AHTTC10 for 10% off online orders. So might oh. see down there. This Can we have that in the ground? Any, any way of getting yeah. that discount to apply in the ground? I think if you ask nicely, but they'll probably still say no. How good is that? That's, that's fantastic. Mm. Right. <laughs> Phil, you've got a COVID test there. You fancy yeah. taking that live and we'll, we'll judge you. Uh... Andy takes that test. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you, actually want me to, you actually want me to do it live? I think you should do it. I want to see. Yeah. yeah. It might. This it might is more for get YouTube. <laughs> Not first uh, time yeah. he said that. Yeah, oh, this yeah. is more for the. But we'll uh, do it later. Give, give me a chance to get it set up. We'll do it later. You can't open the box, can you, Phil? That's the problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Huddersfield Town, uh, not won at Derby since 1957. Uh, 26 attempts later, uh, Derby, with all of their issues, you know, we were sat there, we were rubbing our hands, weren't we, together, looking forward to this one, and then COVID strikes. We've seen, Ollie, we've seen in rugby league the effects of COVID and, and whereas football clubs generally stick to uh, better bubbles and better support bubbles, it shows how easy it is to spread throughout the group as well. Uh, I'm sure town will have some kind of investigation into how it's crept through, although I think it's been hanging around at Canal Side for a while now with the, the B team and the, uh, the juniors there as well. But Phil, I'm going to come to you first when you've, when you've swallowed. Um, <laughs> Have you have you ever been in a situation, you know, throughout your career whereby, you know, you plan all week for a game, you know, the intensity that Carlos brings is is known, you know, there's a lot of video work that goes in, a lot of tactical work, and then a day before the match, four or five people pull out. Have you ever been in a situation before whereby something like that, whether it's injury, flu or anything, has swept through and, and what and how does that throw your plans or the club's plans into sort of disarray and and how do you cope with that and deal with it? I mean, not as not as severe as four or five, but there's definitely been times where people have also come down with flu and and, and literally just overnight as well. So you could be on an overnight stay, um, you know, somewhere in London maybe or something like that. And, and next thing you know, you wake up in the morning, you've got a couple of lads who are, who are struggling. So it's not obviously it's not ideal, but 
you know, back in the day when, when, I, when I was playing, obviously not too long ago, it, was, it wasn't as kind of detailed as it is now. So I'm sure that not just one player is prepped for, for each game in, in terms of tactics and, uh, and, and kind of performance levels. I think that there will be a, a gradual build-up and they generally have a bigger picture. You know, the science is amazing now. So uh, GPS and taking bloods, especially at the Premier League clubs, are, are a really high focus. So generally players are, are ready and in peak condition and ready to go. Um, but obviously for, for us it was a little bit different because you, you, would, you would literally get your info the day before the game and, and some of it was personalised to you if you were left back you'd have the, the right winger to look at um, whereas if, if you knew you, were, you weren't starting that might not have been at the top of your agenda or, or kind of forced upon you so it's you know a lot of swatting up maybe you know a couple of hours before the game and, 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 and just, just hope that you kind of just slide back into the into the groove of the team, and I mean to be fair, like in training, we, you you will you you will change players in and out, and you bring a defender in, and you'll change that. You know, if Nathan Clark were playing, you'd bring you take him out, and you bring maybe young Dave Murphy in, and and, and they get the feel of, of the team. So I don't think it's too much of an issue to be honest. I looked at our team on on on, on Saturday, and and I didn't really see much of an issue. Everybody were playing in positions that they were comfortable in. Um, and and they, they, they all know the roles. They will all know their roles in that team. I've, I've told you before, and I've, I mean, you know, let's link it back to that food. I mean, I was stood at KFC, I was watching the team. iPads, thorough, there were a number of different people on there discussing things. It's, it is really, really, um, really advanced now. And, and I don't think there'll be any stones left unturned. So, so for the lads that have had to come in and play, I mean, I'm guessing the, the, the new keeper, Nichols, was going to start and Ryan had to step in. Ryan played most of the season last year, so it's not an issue. Um, and like I say, I, I missed the game through, um, I was playing cricket well. I, I turned to a cricket match and we got off. Um, but um, obviously, it, it looks like it was a, a half-decent point for me. Obviously, you guys saw the game and, and probably tell me different, but a couple of, couple of standout performances, maybe? Mm, we'll come to those uh, shortly, but a couple of other other people, Ollie, I'm going to come to you on this one. So, you know, we, we've had the COVID crisis as well, and it looks like uh, Bakuna and Mbenza have been sent to train with the B team, so maybe ostracised. You know, there's a couple of uh, gangs maybe going afoot on, on Instagram, isn't there, where Mbenza's then uh, tagged Janino Bakuna and put Toxic with a laughing face and, and things like that. So there's obviously everything's not 100% hunky-dory there. Um, but what, what would your approach be with Bakuna and Benza, taking into account that this is potentially going to be a COVID season. You can see the effects it's had already. Potentially this could reoccur again in a couple of months' time, you know, you know, with different players. Do you, even though Town are taking the approach now to maybe be a little harder with them, you know, in terms of trying to sell them, but do you bring them back in? Uh, do you look to play them? You know, we are paying them. It seems to be a bit of a split with the Town fans as to whether they should bring them back in or just keep them to one side. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I could understand why there are people who are saying that we should look at bringing him back into the fold because our creative options at the moment, especially on Saturday when we've had to cobble together a lineup a bit, we're, we're lacking. But at the same time, you have to assume that something's happened whereby you know they're not welcome to train with the first team anymore. Obviously, we don't know the ins and outs of what goes on on the training ground. But um, if, for example, they weren't putting a good enough shift in, um, you know, they were where this word toxic come from I don't know but you can tell that that's what they've been labelled by somebody hence the joke that's, that was going around on Instagram um, but it's a, it's a tough one for the club as well because obviously they've got two players there who whatever you think of them are assets at the end of the day um, we've seen Bakuna make a difference at championship level we've seen times last season when Mbenza looked to have found his groove again and we've been left with a situation where I think realistically neither of the players actually want to be at the football club. Uh, and that's a really tough starting point. It doesn't, it doesn't help, you know, you leverage in negotiations or anything like that. Um, but now we've got to try and, and shift them. And as I say, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors and things, but I imagine that if there is any interest, then it will it'll come down to things like wages. Are they willing to take a wage cut to go elsewhere? And if not, are they going to dig their heels in and just sit on the bench and, and, and collect their collect their pay? So I don't know. It's a difficult one. I was quite disappointed, to be quite honest. Um, the fact that these two players in particular 
that are now seemingly out of the frame. In fact, Bakuna's talent has been clear to see for, for, for the last few years now. It's, it's just if and when he decides to apply himself. But there's clearly been a player there. However, in Benzer, it was sort of a renaissance last season. It was like having a brand new man. Um, and obviously, he, he, he eulogised Carlos and he heaped praise on him and having, having brought him back into contention. And then now to see the season start like this, it's a real pity. But I think, oh, he's right. Again, we can only speculate. We don't know the ins and outs and, and what's been going on at canal side and, and behind closed doors uh, it may well be that okay it might be a, it might be a behavioral issue it may be that that instigated by the players themselves we just don't know we've had that before haven't we so um but for bringing them back into in, into the fray there's not a long time left in the transfer in the transfer window now and this is still i mean not quite by the, the, the lengths of last season but this is still a very thin squad um and and so look the, the powers that be will will have will have had some sense in this decision and whether it's a temporary fix and whether it's just to say, look, we're going to play hardball with you. We're not going to be pushovers. Uh, only time will tell if that's the right move. Uh, I think it'd be a shame, if I'm honest, to see both of them go. Um, like I said, there's two players there, but also then that's, 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 that's two less bodies. And this isn't going to be the only time that we're going to have to put together a squad. You know, this is going to be a long old season, maybe not as intense, but if this is happening in week one, you know, what happens if we get a similar injury run like last year? So, I, I, I hope I'd like to see lesson be learned by whichever party and then brought back into contention. But it's 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 a shame to start the season off on this foot with them too. It's an it's an interesting one thinking about how it's been managed and, and looking at the management because if if it is the fact that they've kept them out and there is an issue, whatever the issue is, um, they're kind of making their stance now. And for me to go back on that and to bring them into the team um, wouldn't wouldn't be right to be honest. Um, but like you say, and, and this is, it's all hearsay, nobody knows what it's about. Is it possibly the fact that, obviously, we, we, we want to get rid of them both, uh, get them off the wage bill, and no one wants them at the, the price that we want for them, maybe? So there's, 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 there'll be two issues there, really. Uh, maybe it's his own fault. So, it's it, yeah, it's interesting to see how this one's going to pan out. Mm. Mm. So that's the uh, that's the starting lineup really covered off, wasn't it? So COVID... A mixture of injuries, so it's worth mentioning as well. Aaron Rowe, uh, last time he played, left with uh, one of those boots fitted, you know, where uh, to uh, hold his ankle in place, pretty much. Although I don't think it was as strictly as bad as you know his ankle would fall off. But you know, it, Pippa has also got this groin injury that he's been nursing since January. You know, he's he's struggled uh, to get fully fit, but hopefully he's he's on his way to being mended as well. So you know, Town went into this pretty hit really you know you, you could probably you know Nichols has got COVID so you've got a goalkeeper there you could probably name 11 players out you know for the game which is you know it carries on the theme from last you know the sort of since January from last year even December um, everybody seemed to think you know sort of press wise that Derby were going to be a walkover Cameron this year um, I I got there and I looked at their side and I, I saw oh, I was sat there I thought oh, Curtis Davies okay he's 36 but he's still still a good defender Stephen did okay for his last year a couple of errors aside you know he wasn't that bad you know, Nathan Burns has been one of the best right backs in the in the league for the last couple of seasons. You know, you know he's 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 a decent player. Forsyth's been there for a long time, a lot of experience. And Colin Kazin Richards, etc. Okay, it's not a vintage derby side, but it didn't seem to be as bad as what potentially it could have been. I, I thought for the stink that Wayne Rooney kicked up in the weeks preceding the start of the season, I really thought this is going to be this is going to be a B team second string derby development squad that we were going to be facing. And then I, I was the same as you, Matt. Come two pm on Saturday, I looked at the team and I, I looked at the eleven. I thought it's all right, that it's okay. And then I looked at the bench, and you can you can kind of understand yeah. that that was all they had, the eleven, you know. And, and that's a that's a great result for them, isn't it? Um, but in in a year where we've had River Plate play a continental game with a with a goal without a goalkeeper in their squad because of COVID, and didn't they win as well or something like that with a with a centre back in there? Yeah. And for them, Wayne Rooney to carry on like he did in the weeks uh, ahead of the game uh, and, and, and sort of turned Derby into the victims of the situation, really, I thought. I don't think that's unfair to say. And then you've got Camille Yosviat, you've got Tom Lawrence, Colin Kazin Richards, Richard Stearman. Uh, all right, yeah, not much behind that bench, but these are lads who've played careers at second division level. Um, it was certainly a, okay, it was a bottom end squad, but it's not, I wouldn't even say it was relegation fodder. Um, and no doubt they will have some more bodies through at some point. So, so no, okay, it's not it's not a squad that's going to be threatening you, and it's a squad you want a result against. And I think if Town had a full squad, then okay, maybe that does transition into 
two points dropped. But for what for what was happening before and, and all the parlance around that, I mean, okay, maybe it's um, some A grade deflection tactics because it's been a rather busy summer for for Damian and for Mister Rooney himself. But um, no, I was I was I was I was surprised, um, and and it put a different complexion on the game really. Well, I I thought the whole thing, the whole Rooney build up to the game, and then what he said after the game about it being a great point, I, I found it all so hypocritical because he made it out like he was being properly hamstrung by selection issues, and then after the game he comes out and said, in the twenty four hours before the game, I think I changed my starting lineup four or five times. It's like, what? Which one is it? Have you got loads of options so you can change your lineup that many times, or have you got no players and you know everything the world is against Derby? Uh, starting, they're starting eleven. Um, it wasn't bad, you know. It, it, it's pretty similar, I guess, to what they might have put out last season. A lot of experienced championship pros in there. But the first thing, when I saw their team at two o'clock, you know, I, I was like, get in. They're playing a 36-year-old Curtis Davis and a 33-year-old Richard Stearman at centre-half. Let's target that, you know. Let's have some pace and trickery in the final third. Try spin Stearman around because we know what happens when, he, when he's got his back, uh, when he's facing goal. Um, and... I was a bit disappointed then to that extent that Town didn't really exploit the obvious weaknesses in their lineup. They've got some talent in the forward group to an extent. You know, I think that Josiak's going to Galatasaray for four million or something. Um, and uh, obviously, Callan, Colin Cousin Richards has played uh, a lot of second division games. Tom Lawrence, um, we know he seems to always have a good game against Town. I didn't look at their team and think it was going to be a walkover, but I still thought that we should have had enough. Um, and I don't know how much of that is the media narrative building up to it. Like you said, Cam, about how we, we might be facing a B team, basically. Uh, and then that didn't end up happening. Uh, some people might look at it as a point game, but I don't. You know, we, we aren't going to get a better chance to, to win at their ground. We've done it once in 86 years or something. And um, I think everybody deep down in the build-up to the game expected us to to get a, a long-awaited win there and it didn't happen and all of a sudden the narrative has shifted to um it's a good point away from home to start the season I think if that's if that's what's going to be our benchmark then the standards are incredibly low maybe Wayne Rooney's got it all ass about face again eh? but we'll move on from uh, I've been waiting to get that out for two minutes sorry I have to apologize but <laughs> Go to the game itself because we've we've sat here and talked and not really talked about the game in any great depth. Um, Town, I thought they started the game quite well, quite brightly. Had a lot of the ball. Uh, Levi Colwell and Nabisar used it quite intelligently from the back. You could see what Town were trying to do, trying to pass through the thirds, you know, effectively and into midfield. Uh, Dwayne was the you know the initial recipient where he would try and spin and move into space. And I think Derby picked uh, Dwayne up quite well. Uh, Graham Shinney in particular picked Dwayne up quite well, which meant that Dwayne didn't see as much of the ball as maybe what he should have. Uh, Scott High brought a lot of energy. You know, he presses really well from the front. Um, you know, him and Lewis O'Brien do do quite a similar thing in terms of, you know, being able to press on the front foot. Um, Scott's obviously a, a fair bit further back in, in his development than what Lewis has been, you know, two or three years younger. Um, but I thought Derby slowly wrestled the game back from town and and just made it a bit bitty, really. You know, they, they kind of sat in. And, and Town's... Um, a lot of town's problems in the last sort of six, seven months, you know, going back into last season have been when a team sits in town, find them very difficult to break down and go to what you say as well, Ollie, in terms of the system that town picked, I think it was more forced upon them than, than potentially um, picked out, you know, picked strategically. Um, but I just felt Sauber Thomas will come on to it in particular, who was outstanding, you know, for, for the whole 90 minutes. I just felt that maybe town needed two higher wide players, you know, to kind of press and get behind on the outside of Davis and, and Stearman. And we saw that a little bit when Karoma and Campbell came on towards the end. But for me, the system was more forced on us. And I think that didn't help Ollie, I'll, I'll be honest. But, you know, you look at the terms of towns, I know town fans don't like XG, do they? You know, in, in general terms, you know, a lot of us will turn the nose up. But I think XG is quite a good marker of chance quality as opposed to anything else. And, and town were the fourth highest in the division, you know, with 1.68, which shows that chance creation maybe wasn't the issue at this point and maybe the quality of the finishing was. And um, so there's a lot of uh, variables in this, in this actual game. There's some positives we can take from this, a couple of negatives maybe. Um, but for me, you know, you look at Pearson's header, Campbell's shot, which Keller Roos has saved. And I, I kind of think 17 shots to Derby's six, maybe this is potentially two dropped. Um, I went into that 
feeling <laughs> this is really pathetic but i went into this thinking this is potentially two teams at the bottom you know um not going to say relegation six pointer on day one of the season because that'd be silly but it felt like this could be a real key game to get us off to a good start you know get um you know carlos back in with the town fans if you like even though he wasn't there and i didn't think town played badly or anything i just felt coming away from the end they did okay but maybe we should have nicked that one on I think it's not it's not a bad performance. We've seen we've seen some bad performances, um, and I, I'm definitely in the point the point gain camp. Um, maybe that's because, like Ollie said, the bar has been lowered, and I'll, I'll take I'll take a lot less than I would have settled for a year ago. Um, but I think you're right as well that, that okay, this was a chance. There's no there's no debate in that, and I think that the circumstances definitely played against us. However, you look ahead; it's not long till we um, till we travel to Sheffield United. We've obviously got Fulham coming right up and everything. There's going to be difficult games ahead, um, but again, it, it's it's boring. But how, how many conclusions can we safely draw after 90 minutes and a, and, a, and, a, and a, okay, a massive pre-season friendly win, but essentially Essentially a pre-season friendly um, with a penalty shootout at the end of it. Like it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to read too deeply into it yet, but yeah, the, 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 the signs were, the signs were good. The signs were good. Um, even the fact that we limited Derby to one shot on goal in the first half, you know, it was like, we, we okay, without excelling, without, without missing, okay, missing a core of the side, I thought that it was encouraging. Um, yeah, it was a shame we didn't get to see Karoma. Danny Schofield came out and said, okay, it was more to do with the shape than anything. I hope that means we're going to see more of him introduced. And I was impressed with Sober Thomas. I mean, caveat, I was at 30th during the actual game, so I've seen extended highlights uh, since then. But uh, but okay, he can put a mean ball in and uh, and everyone was, uh, was, was singing his praises from the rooftops afterwards. So... If we can, if we can get a system that can accommodate on the either flank of Thomas and uh, and Karoma, then okay, we've got we now have a few strike options. I'm not saying they're golden options, um, perhaps in in terms of age, but I don't know about quality. Um, but again, it, the, the signs are, are pointing well. So okay, I can see why people will be disappointed. We only came away with a draw in the lead up, yes, but then that wasn't the derby team we were expecting to play. So for me. I wouldn't say I'm happy with a draw, but I'm I'm content with it. I'm content with it. The You're same. okay with it. You're okay with it. I'm, I'm I'm there now. I think coming away from the game, initially I was disappointed, and then once I've reflected on it on Sunday, you wake up on Sunday, don't you? And you go, actually, do you know what? That's not that bad, really. Do, were you like that, Ollie? Because you you were at the game, weren't you? Um, how how did yeah. you? How did, were your emotions a little bit different from different. Saturday to? Ollie wants now? three points. Ollie just wants three points. That's what I'm here for. I just Ollie dislike won. Derby. Um, no. It, don't turn into those Leeds fans who now hate Derby for some random reason. <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, I don't hate yeah. them. I'm just sick of seeing us get beat there, which we mm. seem to do every time. So in that sense, it would a positive step forward. Um, but I'm not sure I, why no one's mentioned about the fact that Dwayne Holmes were, were, was stood in the hole for the corner. Probably our smallest player on the pitch. Yeah, he's that was... He's in, in, in the hole. And instead of holding his position and dropping a little bit because there were no players around him. He went, moved forwards. The ball went over his head by that much. The lovely goal. back post flick. Time to perfection, he... really. Rolled, it, rolled back the years for Derby, though, didn't he? <laughs> I, yeah. I, think, uh, I think Holmes in particular, um, obviously we're getting a lot of stick from the Derby fans, which I thought was just a bit odd, really. It was borderline obsessive, like they were booing every time he got the ball and Considering stuff. he was pushed out the door rather than walked out. That's I, what I, I mean. I find it a bit like from their fans. He's given them two fingers on the way out or whatever. But um, I think he then started to try a little bit too hard once he realised the crowd were on his back and he, he was getting stuck in. And I kind of like to see the battle from his game. Um, but I would uh, would have liked to just see him that bit further up um, just to cause some problems for them to, to centre-backs. But um, yeah, I guess walking out of the ground, I was... As you said, Matt, more disappointed than angry. You know, it's it's not like we've absolutely run them ragged and we've had five clear opportunities and how was it not our day? And it's not like we were outplayed by a, a really below average team and, and we're lucky to have got a point. It's just somewhere in the middle. But um, yeah, it, it probably is a narrative thing where we're going into it thinking we're facing a team in absolute crisis. If we can't win now, when are we going to win? Um, but... Yeah, it was it was a, a real opening day game. I mean, when you consider how were there five other games that ended one one in the championship, so I think there's a lot of parity in that sense. You know, teams are figuring stuff out. Mm. Obviously, COVID was a big thing for us as yeah. well. Um, that that really did ruin probably any any kind of um, 
hopes that I we think have that's to... that's it, isn't it, Ollie? I think you've got to be realistic and, and realize that that even that you know Phil Phil's right in that you know everybody's drilled you know within that squad everybody knows what role they're playing. It you know from from what I believe they were they were all isolating by themselves in separate hotel rooms you know the the previous day so it must have had some effect, Ollie. Moving on. <laughs> Mm. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. It will do. It, you know, it is a planning thing as well. Um, those players who will have been told that they they're going to be in the in the eleven, um, and and things change. And you look at it as well. Um, in terms of the starting eleven, we were able to put out. We did kind of have a a, a core missing down that left side. Um, you know, Toffolo, when he plays, we know the outlet that he can be. And then obviously you've got O'Brien who brings so much energy and and mm. often quality to the midfield. And then um, obviously Karoma was was perhaps not fully fit or was not started out of tactical choice. But then when he came on, um, I thought that the the game was a little bit a little bit different. It swung in our favour. You know, we we could we could start to see the gaps open up in behind a bit more. Um, and and even Campbell, I've been his biggest critic, but I thought that when he came on, um, we just looked to have something a little bit different. The thing that annoyed me, as, as I've said, I've seen the 11 and, and seen the two centre-backs and thinking we need to be driving down the middle and trying to target these two. Um, but we were just insisting on knocking it down the channels for Wardour Roads to chase. And it was in that sense, as close to a Cowley performance as I've seen probably, but then things change. We, we grew into the game a bit um, that, you know, Derby weren't awful either. I think Rooney, Rooney said it right to be fair that um, in terms of what's happened in the build up, um, how much of that are true, we don't know, but it, it was a pretty good performance from them. And I think that they'll be happy with it. Um, but yeah, half chances that, that didn't happen for us. Pearson, I think he'll he'll fancy himself to score the next chance that he gets like that. Must say, I thought that save by Keller Roos was outstanding, but from where we were, it looked like um, he could have potentially gone near post and and uh, he wouldn't have got to it. But yeah, I don't know. It's one of them. And and I think it's one of those, and you look to the next game being Fulham at home and think, ah, shit, you know, now it starts. Um, we, we could potentially get a bit of a, a bit of a hiding on Saturday if we, if we don't sharpen up a little bit I think that raises a good point though actually um, the fact that obviously the, the weakness was there to exploit down the middle and obviously obviously everyone knows that it's a true self-evident that, that Peeper and Toffolo down the flanks were our best outlet last season best chance of getting into teams uh, when that didn't work we struggled we didn't really have a, a solid plan B and, and again obviously neither of them were available on Saturday and I think we suffered from that we don't really get to turn things around in, 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 into a different light and I know we've brought in Ruffles and Turton to cover those positions and looking forward to seeing them take the pressure off those to a little bit um, but for every game that Toffolo and Peeper are unfit or off form say I don't think we have those players to, to, to take us through the middle I don't think ever since since Aaron Moyer we had someone who can pick those locks in the centre of the park against a better okay against a better team than Derby you would imagine um, and, and if we can't do it against Derby or if we're opting not to do it against Derby it does make me worry and that's definitely a massive limitation of this side now um, I'm sure we'll talk in, in greater depth about Lewis O'Brien later on that he's definitely of course he's the, he's the, the leading light of that midfield um, it, 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 it worries me the over reliance we have on those flanks if that's going to be the game plan every time and there's not really anything under the surface again it, it's a, it is it's a greater squad in terms of numbers than uh, compared to last season uh, but I don't think there really is a second option for us to get behind there and that's uh, that's a little bit concerning when we come up against stronger teams like the ones we've got in coming weeks so Iting's a bit of a miss isn't he after he's gone back because he, he could he could unpick a few locks. Obviously, he had his, his, his issues with injury, but yes, um, we, we certainly do. I, I spoke to uh, Stephen Chicken after the game a little bit, and we were saying, you know, and, and Dave were in a WhatsApp group as well. And I was saying to them, they they were they thought it was quite a fine performance. Generally, afterwards, you know, that they, they obviously look at it with different eyes to to me because you know me as a that you know they, they they class themselves as invested interests, and you know they're both town fans underneath the surface. I think we can all see that a little bit, you know, a little bit. And but they look at it with a different pair of eyes, whereas I've got more emotion, if you like, because you know I'm like all you know, a bit like Ollie, and I've known Ollie on Ollie for a while. You know, you sulk if you lose, and, and you're overly elated if you win, etc. But I came away from that thinking, do you know what? We're probably two players short of being a really competitive side. You know, maybe a starting forward. And I said to them, if you could transplant from 2016, 17, Naki Wells and Aaron Moy into that side, all of a sudden it looked completely different and it looks like a really decent sort of outlet. Obviously they're two expensive players to transplant in, but you know, it would look very, very different. But one player that did get transplanted in, I'm segue in there, uh, Sorba Thomas. So we've not seen a lot of Sorba 
massively since he came from Boreham Wood. Uh, he, you know, he came from, you know, non-league, you know, the fifth tier where he's, he's done very, very well. Um, everybody talks about numbers these days, don't they? Say the numbers were good. And everything, you know, everything that we saw from Sauber Thomas was was excellent from that left flank. He has played left wing back for Boreham Wood before as well. So him fitting in seamlessly, he he really shackled a good right back in, in Burn. You know, Nathan Burn's been a good fullback for a while, you know, in the championship, a good second tier fullback. And every time he went forward, he was covered off brilliantly by Sauber Thomas. You know, he... He outpaced him, you know, he had more strength. He kept cutting back in uh, and he was fouled six times by uh, by Derby. You know, they, they couldn't really handle him. One assist, nine key passes in the game, five accurate crosses. You know, he he had an outstanding game, did Sorba Thomas. There's no two ways about it. He created the chances for Pearson, Campbell, the goal for Nabisar. And, you know, when you look at the towns you know, in terms of balance and Ollie mentioned Mbenza, you know, and his creativity earlier, you know, Mbenza was great at putting the ball across. And and now all of a sudden, and Benz is on his way out. But Sauber Thomas potentially comes in, and and all of a sudden you can now see the balance in the town starting lineup being potentially with Karoma on one side, and Sauber Thomas on the other. You've got someone who can go on the outside and deliver, and somebody who can come in and shoot. And all of a sudden, Jordan Rhodes signing. I thought Jordan played okay on on Saturday. I thought there were a little a couple of bits and bats here where his hold up play was actually better than I I remembered. Uh, and all of a sudden you can kind of see that making more sense now because Jordan's runs were threatening. I didn't really think much to Danny Ward in terms of his, you know, how much of a threat he was. Um, it worked hard, but the threat really wasn't quite there. But you can now see that fitting together, and Sinani is going to be an interesting one coming in as well, isn't he? So um, Sauber Thomas, Ollie, you, you were at the game. I thought he was outstanding. He was the man of the match, clearly. He was head and shoulders the best player on, on the pitch. I are you as excited as maybe what I'm, I'm getting carried away already? You know, this is what I'm on about uh, with the emotional side. Are you getting carried away by Sauber Thomas after one game? I've seen some some funny tweets, uh, people saying, you know, we bought £30 million worth of wingers in that in that second summer in the Premier League and all it took was a lad for how, however much from Bar and Wood to fix all our problems. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting carried away just yet. Um, I, I really liked what I saw. As you said, he was clearly the best player on the pitch. Um, I guess... What we've been missing for a while now, especially when we had our injury problems last season, was a bit of dynamism, a bit of confidence, a player who wanted the ball, you know, was demanding the ball and, and wanted to get into dangerous positions. And particularly, one of my biggest frustrations that we had last season was when, when we inevitably couldn't break down teams that, that blocked. Um, we would get the ball wide and hopelessly cross it time after time and there'd be nobody there or there'd be no quality on the delivery. You know, our set pieces, I didn't feel like were particularly great last season until Mbenza started shooting every time. Um, but Sauber was sort of like the antidote to all of that. Um, and and he was definitely the, the one that we looked to when we wanted to get a foothold in the game as well. Um, as you say, six fouls drawn. I mean, it felt like he was getting kicked from pillar to post, really. But he earned those fouls with his quick dribbling, with his intelligent movement. Um, a fantastic ball in for the equalising goal as well, obviously. Um, I, I really can't fault that performance. And I hope that it's the first of many to come. Obviously, there are a few disclaimers with it, I guess. Um, that obviously it, it was against Derby. Um, and it, but they're not that bad, like we said. No, no, that's true. And Bernie, Bernie is a good fullback as well. Um, and I like Forsyth as well. I think the two fullbacks are probably the strongest part of their team. Um, but yeah, he did, a good, he did a great job. Now we need to see that followed up. Um, I went to Fleetwood for that pre-season game. And again, he thought Sauber was the best player for us then as well. Um, he just looks like he's got a bit of something about him. We've been massively missing players who have that confidence to say, give me the ball, I'll, I'll do something with it, I will create something. Um, there's a bit of Karoma in, in that sense as well. So if we've then got two wingers, as you mentioned, a left, a left-sided left option and a right-sided option where um, the, the opposition, if we're counter-attacking, do not know which side we're going to go down, then that can only be good for us moving forward. Um, and the service into roads is going to be very important this season, uh, as you mentioned. He... I know it's the old saying and it seems like we've said it for every centre forward we've had for the last five years but if he gets the service he does still know where the net is um, he's adjusted his game a little bit and I, I, I saw that in pre-season and saw it on, on Saturday as you mentioned I think his hold up play his play with back to goal uh, has got better he's got tidier with the ball um, his first touch passing out wide and stuff was was good um, but 
I just think he looked to be lacking a little bit of sharpness where he might have made a, a, a smarter near post run. He instead just sort of hung around the penalty spot. Um, but he was feeding off scraps a little bit as well, as was and understanding as was develops, doesn't it? As as the yeah. season goes on, understanding will develop, surely. Yeah. yeah. Uh Cam, we, we saw we saw with Thomas as well last season, Phil as well. You know, when we were beat by um, Norwich, you know, the 7 0 Norwich, we don't want to talk about that too long. But Sauber Thomas came on during that game and he, he was head and shoulders town's best player. Uh, are you are you guys excited about the potential of him as well? We've seen little bits drip fed in here and there. I think one thing to maybe consider is he has played left side throughout. So, you know, moving him across to accommodate from Karoma is a bit of an unknown. Um, but are you, are you guys excited and are you hopeful that we've maybe found? You know, me and Phil, me and Phil, we did the um, preview show. And I think we all predicted Sauber Thomas to be the breakout player, didn't we, for, for this year? And Ollie, you did, uh, Ollie and, and Cam, you both did um, a little video as well. I think everybody pretty much said Scott Hyer, Sauber Thomas. Did you guys imagine it would be game week one whereby, you know, that breakthrough comes? Well, I, I actually, I did say pick calm him. down, Matt, if I you know. want as well. <laughs> you are, you can say <laughs> I, that, I, I, I didn't pick him uh, and not because I don't back him, um, but my feet are staying firmly firmly planted to the carpet um because look okay let, let's be honest he played some beautiful balls in and we were really unlucky i thought that okay Rhodes came close with their header um the, the cross for Saar was exquisite um however okay this is 90 minutes against the side that are going to be fighting against it for the for most of this season let's not get ahead of ourselves here like yeah okay he's clearly a talent and, and, and it's quite right i saw those tweets too ollie and it's weird how you got karoma and him two 22 year olds one from southern one from 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 southern one from newham and then and, and all those all that million splurged in on, on the continent and and and, and what do we have to show for it so hopefully you know fingers crossed but again the burden of expectation can can, can fall pretty heavy um it didn't do Schofield any benefit last season I don't think and like look okay he might be a completely different player he may play with confidence but he's only played eight games at championship level okay and start like, as well wasn't it and he's and he's been, but he's been, he's been playing men's football for a long time. Okay, he's, he's racked up about eighty games in national league. Um, but I, do, but I don't, I don't want to judge him too early here. Um, in the same way, I like to think that if he'd had an absolute stinker, I wouldn't have written him off. And so I don't want to. I'm, I'm having to hold myself back in my seat here and not and not jump onto the bandwagon too much because okay, he was playing against some good players in quite a poor team. Um, However, one thing I will say, though, and I think it's good that we've brought in Rhodes into that debate, is the fact that Jordan Rhodes, okay, he's, he's 10 years may have gone past, but his game his game was that second ball. That was what he scored 40 goals a season off. You know, he was never someone that was going to create a chance for me from 30 yards out and beat three men. He just had the brain that, he had a brain that could put him in that spot before any defender could get anywhere near him. Um, you know, we saw him do it three times in 10 minutes against Dexter that time. He's, he's, he, he, knows, he, he knows how to anticipate. And so, yeah, of course, I imagine he's rusty. He's not, he's not played anything like regular football for about four seasons now he's been employed as an, an impact sub which he isn't and and so if you've got someone that can deliver a whizzing ball into the box at a dangerous height for him then yeah the, the, those cobwebs are going to get blown off and so I think that the fact that okay we might have them on the same wing but that now we have Karoma and Thomas capable it seems of, of playing with that intensity and putting in that quality of ball there could be a recipe for something there but Again, you know, I don't want to put pressure on the lad. I don't know if he's if he's going to be listening to my ramblings. Come on, but I don't get want excited, get excited, him, come on. Getting behind him, etc. I wish him all the best. Get yourself one of these, Cam. You, it's, can, it's, have, it's you can have the conch to go with my Karoma one. Come on. It's 90 minutes. Um, good signs, good signs. But again, uh, no massive conclusions on him for this one for me. Okay. Seems like a bit of a maverick, doesn't he? I like him. I like his attitude. I think... Um, He's, he's happy to be where he is. You can see, obviously, with the non-league element to it, um, everyone wants to play professional football. So it, so he's got a real chance here. And, and, and like I say, if, if he's allowed to express himself and, and have a few bad games, uh, which we know will happen, um, I think it'll be I think it'll be totally fine. You can see, technically, he's very good. If he's played wing back as well, you know, it's, it's it, it, within our, our team. If you can defend from from a wide area. Um, as well, that makes a big difference. Um, but for me, it's it's in and around. You know, it's all right in front of a few step overs and beating his full back and then cutting inside and playing a beautiful ball between two defenders to one of our strikers. But can't score from five yards out, then sometimes, do you know what I mean? It's 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 difficult. And like you mentioned earlier, we create chances. So it's not as if we haven't created chances in the past. It's, it's putting it away. So 
I think he'll be. I think he'll be totally fine. I think. I, I, I honestly think in the wide areas we, we look okay. Um, we, we've got some exciting players. Row Aaron, Aaron know, yeah. it, Aaron's if he's still at club, I have no idea whether he's still here. Yeah, uh, but he's play once, I think. Um, and then and obviously Croman and, and Sorma Thomas look look really really exciting. Um, for me, it's, it's the other other areas. And when you said we need two more players, I think you're probably right. Um, I think it's probably more three or four. Um, when, That's when for playoff size, when, that Phil, three or four. What's that? That's for playoff size, three or four, two, just to yeah. get us, you know, bobbing along nicely. Yeah, well, but uh, when, when does when does the loan window close? Good question. Um, usually, I'm going by uh, historically. Usually, you get two weeks after the closing of the window, don't you? Yeah, to, it's uh, to pick up, pick up Premier League. Yeah. 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 I, I just think we're crying out, we're crying out for some. Um, Kind of for a bit of creativity from if you, if you two two Aaron really Moy from China. Players. That's what we want. Oh, imagine, imagine that. I've so already offered legs, to fly out. His, and legs pick him up. Gone, his legs have gone. Hey, just going back to Jordan Rhodes. Um, I, I remember years ago when I, I I was playing for Halifax at the time and I managed to, to sneak in a game and I remember his, his his movement off the ball is frightening. Like I, I was sat in the uh, in the stand next on the the dugout side in the top tier and you could see his movement great, but. Maybe a reason he's holding up a little bit better now is his, as his legs gone. So maybe in t- instead of getting him behind, now he's having to change. I don't know if he ever had them. To be he was never a quickest one, yeah. really. He was well, he weren't. No, no, he weren't. But he used to be like... really, really good at timing his uh, yeah, run off the, the timing, shoulder of the defender. Yeah. You know, but if he were never um, the quickest, how quick is he going to be now? <laughs> no, <not laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we saw that with uh, Levi Colwell played a really great ball through the channel and Rhodes made an outstanding run, didn't he? And he got, the, I'll tell you what, got behind. what a player, what a player that kid is, by the mm. way. Yeah, he's, okay. going be, he's, he's going to be a big player for us. I, I wonder whether they're going to try and move him forward a little bit. I'll tell you um, what, Phil, the best bit he did in the game, Levi Colwell, was when he missed a header and you know he, he misjudged the bounce and uh, the right winger... Cam pronounced it far better than what I can earlier, but he he got actually he got I think it was him or Sibley one of the two got behind, and his recovery speed and the recovery tackle with his wrong foot his right leg was frighteningly good. You know, for an eighteen year old to have that confidence just to say, "Nah, you're not having that. I'm having it," was was outstanding. And I thought, you know, yeah, eight, he was, eighteen he was years old. I mean, that just scares <laughs> me. I was playing Call of Duty at eighteen years old. Like, Still playing it, Ollie. No, I haven't played it for a while. <laughs> I haven't played it for, but no, he, he was superb. I was actually sat on the road behind his uh, uncle who had come to watch him. And that was fascinating to see because every time he, he put in a good tackle or that one when he went on that run and sort of burst past two players, they were getting right into it, like yeah, it's good. cheering that's, him on. And, and it, it, were, um, it were infectious. We were all... You it know, is great all... to see people. You know, you don't, you don't see enough of that, really. Sometimes you have to stay, sometimes you have to stay a little bit quiet when you're, when you're a family member because you've got fans in and around who, who are... We were happy to slate you. You know, I remember mm-hmm. playing away at Chelsea and, and when that first goal went in against Carlton Cole, uh, my missus were crying because there were people absolutely slating me. I mean, I'm used to it, yeah, so it didn't bother me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's some, 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 you know, some parents will stay quiet. They won't, but I think it's nice that you can that you can get involved. And you're like, it's a big deal, really. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, yeah. it's a big thing. So it's, it's the start of his career. So. People were there as well. He, he was sat next to him. Um, so it was good to see him in the stands. He, he came with what I presume was his girlfriend. But it was good right. because he was having pictures with people and he was saying hello to everyone. And, yeah, good. and that was uh, random aside, like, but that that did uh, that was nice to see. Um, yeah, it, it feels like that bond is maybe starting to come back now. I mean, I, I feel like it is partly the novelty of being able to go back to the games, yeah. of course. And I think the, the club have got a short window upon which they can seize on that. And okay, it's majorly dependent on results, isn't it? But now we've had that frostiness between club and fans for quite some time now. And I think this is the first signs of that starting to thaw. I hope I'm, I, uh, I'm not, not too early, but I, I, I hope think, that's... yeah, mm. I feel like Matt and, and I've spoken, obviously I've been on the pod more with you, but after the last couple of years of complaining about not spending the Premier League money properly, I feel like we're back to a level now where we're just back to Huddersfield. And, and that's forgotten about totally. I couldn't give a toss about where this money's gone now. I feel back like we're just back to twenty thirteen, aren't we? Yeah, mm. where we were. We're, you know, we're underdogs, kind of thing, and and it's a new season. So I'm 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 quite um quite more optimistic about this season. To be honest, that's good. I was going to throw in as well. Just my last observation from the game was Naby Sara. I came away thinking Naby was was okay on the day, and then. I think it was from a, a conversation with St- the same conversation with Stephen and Dave, and they they were quite. Um, effusive in their praise of him and you know I did look at that and I did reflect on that and 
you know, Naby scored. He's made two tackles, one interception, three clearances and three block shots. He usually in a back three plays on that left side where, where Levi Colwell did, but he, you know, he played in the center for the first time. And I've always thought Naby has the potential to bring the ball out and pass, you know, and not be uh, one of the center backs with the, you know, with the striker. And I thought he looked quite comfortable there. Ollie, I'm going to go mm. to you because obviously you saw the game and I, I reflected on it and Naby actually, you know, we always say, you know, he's either Naby Moore or he's a disaster. You know, you, you get, you know, you never get a six out of 10. It's always a nine or a three. Yeah? Yeah. And he had a very good game, but on reflection, he did, he did, did very well, Naby Sa. And he's shown that he's got, you know, we've brought Colwell in, but Naby's still got, you know, a big part to play here. And, you know, he's, um, he's definitely one to, uh, one to keep close. Yeah, he, he was. I thought he was good. I, when again saw the team sheet, one of the first things my, my eyes were drawn to that was Sar was starting, and um, we know what we're getting from him in a way now. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> that's the no, problem. He's consistent. <laughs> we do, but we don't. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's consistently inconsistent. Um, and you know, w- uh, when it's his day, I actually think that he's a really, really useful defender, um, and he can do a wide range of things. I mean. You know, his recovery pace isn't the best and stuff. And like that Blackburn away game back end of last season when he had an absolute nightmare. You look oh, at that yeah. and you think, oh, confidence is going to be shot from something like that. But um, in in particular in Saturday's game, I thought he looked really comfortable, as you say, in the middle. I wasn't expecting that. I, I really thought Pearson would probably play in the middle. Um, but, you know, I, I can't really say anything other than you say about how we get a three out of 10 or a nine out of 10 from him. Uh, it was probably a seven out of 10. You know, it was, it was nice. It was, it was solid. And if he can just keep doing that, if he can just keep building um, week after week, then we're going to have a really useful either piece for our starting 11 or depending on if we change systems, we're going to have someone who's, who's reliable um, for if we do suffer with more injury problems and stuff. And I think that Colwell's arrival as well, yeah, seeing how competition, yeah. Yeah, he's got competition, and that that definitely drives up the levels mm. a little bit. Um, and you know, I, yeah, I'm all for that. So let's see, same again on Saturday against Fulham, presuming he starts, and um, and we can start to talk about a rejuvenated Naby Sarr. I think that central role suits him because it's it's a bit of a free role to be honest, uh, playing in the back three because you, you're literally sweeping, so you're playing off the shoulder of each of the of the, of the two of the defenders. So with with his unreliability. I think it probably helps, and, and, and going with that will help a, an experienced goalkeeper or someone with that knowledge of that tactic to be behind him, um, because it's really important that you have that clear information. So I think it'll, I think it'll suit him really well. Um, I love the fact that you called his performance nice. I like that. He had a, he had a nice, nice. Performance. It was nice. It was tidy. <laughs> like we're so used to him being untidy as a player, and it was just nice to see a, a tidy yeah. nice start. Yeah, but he can play though, can't he? That's the thing, and that's yeah. that's one of the that, that's probably why he is where he is, and 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 why Charlton were obviously not too bothered about him leaving because you know that he's got a he's got one in him where he, he can throw one in, but at the same time he's got he's obviously he's got everything, he's got every attribute, he, he's good with the ball at his feet at, at times, um, very good, uh, and and obviously his his physical power and presence is 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 you know dangerous in both boxes kind of thing, so. Um, if you get the good side of him, you buzz in. But if not, then and it's, you know, it's it's been dropping on a on a on a on a good day really. There was a period last season when he was genuinely our biggest goal threat. Yeah, and and that says a lot. You know, as you say, yeah. uh, height was an advantage at both ends. But he he did this thing as well last season, and we didn't particularly see it on on Saturday because of the role that he was playing. But he would properly stride out of defence, like we used to see Joel Lynch do. He would he would just say, oh, well, if nobody else is offering for the ball, I'll just yeah, walk with yeah. it myself. And and they didn't know what to do because other teams were not expecting it. Um, and I, I liked that. But then, obviously, as you say, it was a bit of a freer role on on Saturday where he was able to be nicely cushioned in between the other yeah, two. And I think that. that that helped him. Yeah, definitely. I think the only thing there is perhaps his reading of situations that hasn't always been the best, has it? Is it a little rash sometimes? But you know, there are pl- pluses to what he's he's That's done. What I mean, if, if you've got someone in behind that can that can help with that. And contribute yeah. to that, then then you can. I mean, bloody on that Brown did it for us for, for years, and I came off with a sore throat every game because I couldn't stop talking to him. Do you know what I mean? So if he can do it, anyone can. Yeah. So we'll move on from from what was on uh, what was on the field, Ollie, and and come to what was off the field. So you know, Cosy, you know, Cosy for the last oh, twelve months since March last year has pretty much been saying 
you know, the same thing every week. Just let me click through that turnstile and go and take my seat and finally go back in the ground, have a beer with everybody. And Saturday came, didn't it? The day we were all allowed back in properly for a competitive game for the first time since uh, a game that we won't discuss. Um, so how did you find your your experience, Ollie? I, it was a bit strange for me. I, I went to an England game in the Euro, I went to the final in the Euros, but which was a completely different um, different kind of game, really. Uh, but being back for Huddersfield Town felt a little strange, but also really familiar at the same mm. time. It was a little bit odd. Um, not many, no one wearing masks or anything. It, it kind of felt like it slipped back in, really. But I think at, at times it just felt like maybe people felt a bit rusty, like they were watching it on. I like you know you've spent so long watching it, and I follow sitting there quiet. That sometimes you know town fans went were quiet, quiet for spells, and it was like oh we can sing, and it was like it was quite. You know, it was quite an interesting experience, but I thought the town fans overall, you know, got some stick, didn't they, from Derby fans for being poor, and I thought that was nonsense, to be honest. Yeah, well, you're going to get that from idiots on Twitter, right? Yeah, you should not listen to those types. But I thought town fans did did all right, and it was good to see them back and good to hear Smile a while again in in the ground, and, you know, and uh, it was good to uh, good to see some old friends again. Yeah, I mean... Got a bit of a taste for the for the whole away day thing with the Fleetwood friendly, but obviously it's a completely different thing, you know, that and going to a 2,000 plus um, away following at Derby. Um, Derby isn't like one of the classic away days. It's not like a Fulham. It's not like a, even a forest Industrial where you really state, look forward it? to. Yeah, it's a bit bland, like the the uh, away pub is a harvesters and it's just not, it's not quite got the same allure as some of them do. But it, it was definitely the novelty thing. I mean, we, we all got the train and the train from Leeds to Derby was absolutely rammed full of town fans. Get out onto the platform, everyone's chanting, oh, there's field. And it's like, oh, we're back. You know, and if there was any initial strange feeling about being back into the um, back in the concourse and it, it quickly evaporated because it felt like being back home. You kept seeing the same familiar faces. Um, I've even missed queuing 10 minutes for a flat pint a lager and that says an awful lot. Um, but uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll throw in that that will no longer happen at home games because we now have Magic Rock Bruins in the ground. So happy days! I had to it, get should, <laughs> it shouldn't happen, but the staff uh, behind the bar in the south stand uh, they don't know how to pull a pint, so I'm not holding my breath. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that being being in the stand was fantastic. Um, it, it's just it's I don't know. It's it like lights a spark in you. Um, it, 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 when you're watching at home on iFollow. You don't sing anything, you know, and it's just strange to be able to. For a lot of people, it's a release, you know. At the end of a working week, you go and you're able to shout and ball, and you're able to sing, and you follow your team everywhere through thick and thin. I mean, I did. God, a few years ago, I did 150 games in a row or something to the point where it was a it was an absolute obsession, like going to Bournemouth on a Tuesday night and stuff. And then to not be able to go for 18 months, I convinced myself that I didn't mind it. But then being back on on Saturday, it's like being hooked again. And, and you know, you want to get back into the habit of going. The game wasn't even a classic. And I've still come away thinking that is a day out that I haven't had for the last 18 months. So in that sense, it was great. And the, and the fans, yeah, um, uh, I think it was disjointed is probably the, the word to use. Um, it was hard, you know, that the singing sections and stuff weren't grouped together together. Uh, Chance took a bit of time to get going. I must say, Derby, annoyingly, have quite a good end there behind the goal. They've got a drum and stuff, and, and they make a fair bit of noise, and it's hard to sometimes get things going. But, uh, it, yeah, the main thing is just, like, being back at... It sounds cringy, but, like, the town family, you know, the people that you've seen every week going to games and stuff, it's just... It's great. Uh, I, I think it's uh, as someone who's been one of the lucky ones who's been able to go into to certain games. I've probably in the, in the press box. I've probably done about probably done about fifteen since things were wound up, um, and and um, it's it was it was just such a it was such a sobering experience because I used to walk down from the train station the same way I would have walked if I was going as a fan. You go past the gas club and it was completely empty. And you'd walk down, um, you'd walk down under arch, and it was still, it was still the same. There was no one million out outside the ground. Like it was, uh, there were no noise, no program sellers, and everything. And the first, first couple of times I did it, it'd been it quite upsetting, thinking this is just not right. Like it's, it, it, it was strange. And then it, the, the weirdness continued inside the ground. Just being able to hear the players talk to each other and the echo, and then. You know, the only celebration you get, you might, you might hear uh, Oggy and, 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 and DTS over one shoulder when, when we, on the rare occasion that we scored, like it was, it, it, it just didn't compare. 
And so I'm, I'm, I haven't been back to a live game yet. I know I'm at, I know I'm at the Preston game in the press box, but I can't, I, I can't wait to get back in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fan capacity because it's like you said, all you do miss the whole community aspect, the family aspect of it. Uh, it's, it's just, I, I mean, because I, it's been a while since I was able to string together a lot of a number of games because of, of work commitments, and I've, I've, I've been aware of how much I've missed it even before the pandemic to then have that obviously no chance of even picking up a spare game every now and then. Um, yeah, it definitely reminds you what you're missing out on. So when, when the traditional way games come back and I'm thinking like your Blackpools, your, your Lutons, et cetera, the proper ones you want to be at, like that's the stuff that you, you live for really. And, and so like it was, yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's an experience that it, go, it goes beyond anything else, really, doesn't it? It's what we've all been waiting for, and, and, and so many people became disinterested and disillusioned with it, and not just because of the football we were playing, but because you can't be there. There's no rousing the team. There's, 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 there's no encouragement. It's just you looking at I follow. And so, and so now that this, I've never, even though I've seen Town in far, far better shapes coming into a season, I've never been so excited for the beginning of a campaign. It's funny, you talk about like going to games and watching live matches. Just listening to you both talking there, like as as, as fans and, and me playing and playing playing for the team and, and missing out on a few years of doing that. I, I can't remember after the games I played. Like, <laughs> during, during the game, about twenty. Phil, what's going I on? <laughs> you know, lads, lads, will, lads will talk. I know, yeah. lads will talk and they'll say, "I remember when this happened." Blah 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 blah. I can remember everything about walking up to the old Leeds Road and walking up the steps. I can remember all of that. I can remember the smells. I can remember the brand new ground. I, I remember walking down. I remember the music that, that played on the on the on the um, on the speakers as I walked down the ground. I know the music now; it'll play and, and it'll just be like right. I remember all of that, and, and it's it's a big thing, really. And, and all these years that I've, I've been playing football, and then to come back and, and to experience that the match day, it's it's massive because I love it. I absolutely love bringing my kids to the game, standing under the stand, having more than one beer. Um, going into rope walk before a game, you know, I, I would never think about I'd, I'd do that before a footy match. I'd just normally go to the game and then come out. But just all of that, it just it, it's it's brilliant. And and obviously I missed missed the weekend, but I'm looking back, looking forward to getting back into the ground, not just for the game, but for everything about it. Meeting the same people before having a beer, leaving five minutes early before I finishes, so I can race to, to thingy to get one of those crap full pints. Um, you know all, all that kind of stuff. It, it's it, it really is. It makes a difference, and and I'm sure everyone feels the same. It's just great to be back, just for a number of reasons, not just for football. To be honest, yeah, I was I was so I was so happy to be back at on the Saturday. I, I then went to watch the Huddersfield Giants on the on the Sunday as well, and really enjoyed you know the rugby league experience as well. And you know, took my three year old to his first Giants game as well. And it was just it's just great to be back in the ground, you know, with people around, and you know. There was only four thousand there for the Giants, and you know it's going to be you know a lot better when there's fourteen, fifteen thousand there for Town next year. So yeah. I'm really excited as well, and get back to that seat, you know, quite high up, and you know, get back around the same people again. It's going to be it's going to be great. I've not seen my mate Tom for properly since um, Rochdale. We played Rochdale in the League Cup, and uh, the you know relax the um, rules so we could watch the you know watch the game sort of socially distanced. So you know it's going to be great just to see him and you know, see how much hair he's lost over the last 12 months again. You know what I mean? It's going to be really, you know, it's going to be good to see the banter's coming back already. So it's going to be really good. Um, what I've done as well this week, so I've brought a, a new feature. Well, I love features on um, on this podcast. Sometimes I have too many. But uh, I've uh, started a new one this week. Uh, we're n- not able currently to bring the podcast live to people. Um, there's a couple of things going on in the background with uh, renewing the sponsorship, etc., cetera, and, uh, you know, changing software away from Zoom onto something else. So what I've done this week is, uh, to try and get some town fan opinion, I've started uh, a fans forum. So uh, what I will do is on a Saturday, just after the game, I'll ask for opinion just after the game. So it's raw and, it, you know, rather than, you know, reflected. So, you know, I cheat because I give my opinion after a couple of days thought. But I, what I wanted was the actual opinion coming from from fans after the game. So I'll read out a couple of comments that we got back and you guys can jump in uh, where uh, where you like. So let's let's start from Twitter. So... I've got Bjorn Gambax, the first one. He's put the good Navisar is top class and Thomas was excellent. Otherwise, a pretty poor game from both sides. First game of the season, COVID problems for town, all types of problems for Derby, but both teams need to do a lot better or we'll be in a fight at the bottom end. Uh, Dag Barnett, uh, he's put, I'm afraid despite all the undoubted endeavour, our weaknesses are still evident. 
Uh, a lack of quality in midfield and a ponderous tempo. How much better would Thomas look with a quick, incisive ball? Make no mistake, Derby are a poor team. We have to be better. Um, Hudders Wayne uh, says, a decent performance given the pre-match disruption. We looked a lot more solid at the back. It helps that the good Nabby turned up. Sober was superb throughout. The highlight might have been Holmes's cheeky grin to the town fans when the Derby lot were winding him up. I think Derby ended up getting more wound up by Dwayne than the other way there. Uh, Matty Pearson also looks like a no-nonsense type of player that fans will love, and Levi is going to be one hell of a player. Uh, Guy Bradley says, if we can't beat a mismatch put together team from a club in as much turmoil as Derby, then we are going to get relegated. It's as simple as that. COVID isn't an excuse. Uh, Neil Hargreaves... <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is, but <laughs> Jeez. Oh, God. some happy ones. Well, we'll there there are some happy that. ones. Don't worry. Well, that's uh, five minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. we're down. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I give it a long, a bit longer next time for asking? But yeah, no, it's, it's not too. Some of these, you know, no. I'll be honest. Some of these comments that are coming through, I felt very similar after the final. You know, I I did feel very similar after the final whistle. So I'm not going to uh, dig anyone out at all. Neil Hargreaves. Uh, so thought overall we did okay. Thomas outstanding, back four reasonably solid, just lacking a forward who can dominate defenders and hold the ball up. Uh, Chris, e ball. Yeah, Chris Ely says same issues with Schofield, uh, issues with creativity in centre of the park, issues with uh, being toothless up front, uh, high high runs around but offers what? Uh, Holmes is awful. Uh, fact management didn't bring on Sanani until 93rd minute. Um, yeah, I found that was a bit bit odd bringing Sanani yeah. on both games for like 30 seconds. I understood the Sheffield Wednesday one because he took a penalty, but you know, it was yeah. Like, didn't give him a lot of time there. Um, hi, I like Scott High. Um, I've seen him get a little bit of stick on online. I, I think Scott Scott, um, I just call him Scott. I don't know the guy, but I think he's you know he uh, he has a lot of good bits to his game. He's got quite a decent pass on him. He's play, he plays that reverse pass quite well. He's got a lot of energy. He presses. You know he, he gets stuck in. He got turned a couple of times really easily by uh, more experienced Derby midfielders, but I think. I think he's all right. And I think once he starts piecing things together, I think we're going to see a good midfielder there in Scott High. I don't know how you guys feel about it. He looks, he, look, he, he, he looks to try and get up from front straight away, doesn't he? Yeah, he's technically uh, well, as good as well. Yeah, yeah. I like a lot of these young kids that I think coming through are quite technically strong. And, and his first thought is, you know, to, to get on the half turn. I like that. I think we need, we, we, that's the kind of play we need. Yeah, I like um, it. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I understand, understand what people are saying, but I, I quite like Scott High. It's a sad uh, thing as well because he's given that Colwell is, is 18 and that's so freakishly young. You, for, you, you forget that 20 yeah. is, is still quite young. And yeah. so uh, the fact that, yeah, he's in the middle of that formative patch now, really, isn't he? And, and I think we'll have a clearer idea, I hope, by the end of the season. Um, but yeah, he's certainly got all the raw ingredients, hasn't he? Mm. Like, it, I, it, think, I, think, I think we just need to decide exactly where we want to play him. It's all right yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's all right saying, you know, well, he can fill in here, he can fill in there, but I don't think that the situation situations that Carlos threw him on threw him on in last season did him any good mm. um he often brought him on when either the game was gone or uh, he brought him on a in a position when I think it was hard for him to succeed made him um, an easy so scapegoat maybe didn't it as well doing yeah, like that, and, yeah and that's where people started getting the impression last season the rather lazy impression like well what does Scott High do it's like he's not the problem here you know um, but this season, I guess it's a clean slate for him. We're not even close to seeing what he will be like as the finished article. And I hope that if if we do manage to kind of get him into a position um, where we get the best out of his abilities, then he's just going to come on leaps and bounds because technically he's there. With a lot of players that, that make the jump and um, they get sort of drip fed into the fold, you can see the, the gears start to work in their brain as they get a better understanding of what, what goes on at the level and, and with obviously different teammates um, and got to hope that that's the case case for Scott High um, because the work rate's there, the technique seems to be there. Decision-making every now and again leaves you a little bit frustrated, but that's, Inexperience, that's, isn't the, it? Same, that's the same for so many players in our team though. So we can't, we can't look at a 20 year old and say that, uh, well, do anything other than encourage him. Um, and yeah, he might find opportunities a bit more difficult to, to come by when the midfield is fully fit. But as I say, I think a lot of it with young talent, and it's not just him, you know, there's other promising players, Brahima Diara. Um, if, if they're putting in the right positions to succeed, then uh, that's going to that's gonna be great for them. But we can't have them going on when we're 6-0 down to Norwich away and stuff. That's just lambs to the slaughter. Mm. Other than you could argue that, you know, they've got, no pressure on them as well, but we'll we'll move on from from there and, and wrap up these ones. So thanks to everyone that sent those in. HTFC Hursty says probably not as bad as a first thought given our COVID cases, but if we're anywhere near the bottom come the end of the season, this will look like two points dropped, which I think is a, a very fair comment. Uh, Thomas needs to start every game. 
Uh, we've also got Michael Owen, not the Michael Owen, and not you know not the dodgy uh, sexter, you know, a, a, a much more uh, rounded individual here. Uh, he says, same old problem of having good possession but not converting into chances and goals. How many years have we been saying that? I think we have a good solid team that won't concede much, but the pressure is always on the defence when you're not doing the business at the other end. And I think that's probably fair, actually, uh, considering you know we 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 talked about the XG earlier as well, haven't we? And and Town probably should have score more than one but you know I think Cameron's right as well that you know 90 minutes in isolation from competitive footballs probably probably needs more time we probably need more time before we we dive in a bit further on on a couple of the stats there I just Uh, wondered if we've shifted a bit too far the other way though because obviously we hired Carlos under the under the sort of provision that he was going to come in and bring this fast attacking football that we didn't see under Danny Cowley. He was basically meant to be the, the other way. And uh, we definitely saw that in the first half of last season when we went on that nice little run. Um, and, um, and then in the second half of the season, due to a combination of injuries and I think a lack of confidence, um, our style became a bit more reserved. And then the recruitment so far this summer has been heavily centred around reinforcing the defence. And, and people will say, yes, we needed to plug gaps in defence. And I think that's right. But I worry that, as people have said with the messages, um, the problems are still clear for everyone to see. And that is that we are not going to score a lot of goals. And my thinking with Carlos being our manager was that we were meant to be entertaining. Um, maybe you could argue he's becoming more streetwise and realises we're going to win a lot more games 1-0 and 2-1 than we are 3-2 and 4-2 but um, I just think it's kind of going against the whole ethos that we were trying to create a little bit Maybe it'll come back because you need creative players to be open don't you and you know if you go open without the creative players then you you do kind of leave yourself a little bit uh, flapping at the back so maybe that'll come back a bit later on I'll keep fingers crossed on that one um but yeah thanks to everybody that sent the message in the last one actually is reserved for a derby fan called ryan booth great surname uh, and he's put from a derby fan's perspective uh, you look quite good thomas and sarah were quality i know you had a few out uh with covid issues uh so i'm sure you'll do okay this season so i thought that was quite a nice one to end on there from a, a derby fan who uh Nobody randomly, cares randomly about came a Derby in. fans. Opinion. Do you know what? Ollie, Ollie slated them and said they all talk nonsense on Twitter, but I'm taking that one and, and holding them up as the bastion <laughs> well, of Derby fans on Twitter. So now go on your If he says we're going to be all right, we're nailed, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> there we go so thanks for that uh, I just want to quickly mention as well uh, recently in the last couple of weeks that the uh, HTSA uh, heritage site has gone live it's a fantastic website full of uh, resources and Ollie's sat there trying to google it now um, HTSA um, hyphen heritage oh, hang on heritage.com uh, great website Ollie you know I I, I was lucky enough to have a, a peek behind the curtain quite early I think Cameron you, you, you might have been as well and it was fantastic to go back and be able to just look at the clippings from the first game that I went to as a kid. You know, they're all there, the newspaper clippings from the examiner. And there might even be uh, some clippings from when Phil Senior played for Huddersfield Town in there. Who knows? You know, those heady days. Good seasons as well, Phil, 2003-04. Um, but yeah, fantastic website. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would genuinely genuinely encourage any town fan who who likes looking into into sort of archives to to have a look at this because it really is a fantastic website and big congratulations to everybody who... Yeah, it's a great idea. Fantastic. Mm, yeah, is there any videos is. on there as well? There is. There's only three or uh, four, I think, at the minute. There's the highlight goal highlights from uh, 89 to 92, the three videos. And I think the Nottingham Forest game from the, the old Rumbelows Cup is is on there from, from the late 80s as well. So it's, it's fa- honestly, it's a fantastic website. And, you know, I think everybody associated that with should be incredibly proud of yeah, themselves. Definitely. So well done. Definitely, Jim as well. A great, a great guy behind it as well. And and it couldn't have launched at a better time either, because when we just needed a bit of a pick me up in terms of you know what it means to be a Huddersfield Town fan, uh, what you've got there is a collection and a celebration of our best moments as a club. And you look at that and you realise we've actually got something to be really proud of here. And you know, yes, we might be rubbish at times, but um, wouldn't change our team for the world, would we? So. Um, it, it's a fantastic project and um, it's something that everybody should check out because there'll definitely be something there that interests uh, everybody. I did I did promise I would write an article or do a podcast on the Hall of Fame that they're doing as well. This is, this is something that came up from conversation quite early on as well. Uh, I actually likened it to, uh, this is really sad and I'm, I'm going to get pellets for this, but what they do in, in wrestling, and I don't watch wrestling, Stephen Chicken does, so, you know, send your abuse there. Yeah, but they, they do this uh, Hall of Fame thing that pops up on BT and Sky every every so often where they induct people into a Hall of Fame. And I thought that was quite a nice idea for football. You know, you can adapt it to football and maybe bring someone into a Hall of Fame and make a fuss of them, you know, every 
every 12 months or so. And I think that's potentially what they're going to do as well. So uh, they are voting on a, a Hall of Fame at the minute. So I encourage everybody to go to the Honours and Records section Hall of Fame and vote for David Wagner. So they what, type of, um, what type of wrestling does Chicken watch? Uh, <laughs> there's a little bit... <laughs> I'll, do you know what? I'll, uh, we'll ask him next time he's on. But I think there's, there's a little we're bit of mud, a little bit of mud in there, a little bit of uh, sumo, a little, sumo, bit, of, yeah, little bit of everything. Yeah. Wrestling, Olympic well, wrestling. I think he loves it all. Loves I used it all. to, I used to work in the office with him, and I, uh, his his um, knowledge of wrestling is freakish. He's like, the top he, guy. He, he knows everything. Like old WWE, yeah. WWE, he'll be able to tell you who, who wrestled who at WrestleMania in 1987 and stuff, and it's. Yeah, it's, ask him it's about when um ask him about when Hulk Hogan threw Big Boss Man off of a cage. <laughs> that was a good one. Let's I, move on. That one. Let's, let's, let's move rest, on. International great wrestling special. <laughs> both playing on canvas with blood on the face. I don't know how they got blood on because it's not real, is it? They cut themselves. <laughs> they actually have a they have a razor underneath their. Um, no, this is going into way too much Neil depth, razor, is it? Do they? Yeah, they they have a razor, an actual razor blade underneath their like their their arm bandages, and they actually take it out and cut themselves. That's completely um, made up. It's, it, no, it's not. It's mental what they do. <laughs> it's honestly, it is crazy. But anyway, enough wrestling. Uh, speaking of um, big characters like you get in the wrestling, Michael Heffley returned. That was uh, that was a great pick me up. I thought for town fans, um, Heffley. Unfortunately, Mike, you know he's had to retire from playing. You know, and we wish Heff the, the very best, don't we? In, in whatever you know, in in everything he does moving forward. Um, in terms of personalities for the football club in the last 30 years, genuinely you cannot think of anyone that you'd want to have a beer with more than Michael Heffley, could you? So to bring a character like this back who's associated with success, associated with good times and a real cult hero, I thought was a smart move from Huddersfield Town. It, it feels like they didn't have a specific role for him and he's going to you know, plug in little bits but, you know, he, he's showed up on YouTube already. He's done two weeks with the academy training. There's so much potential with Michael Heffley because we interviewed him on, on the podcast last year for uh, for Andy Takes That Chance. And what really struck me was he's sometimes painted as this uh, figure of fun, if you like, you know, this this sort of maybe, maybe not daft, but this sort of really fun character, you know, outgoing and humorous. But when you ask him about certain situations, you can see a real steel behind his eyes and a real... Um, you know, will to be successful and, you know, and someone who will take absolutely no nonsense from everybody. And, he, you know, and there is a real, really good serious side to Michael Heffley as well. And I think we'll see that in what he does. And I think this is going to be a really good camp. Well, I think it's just a brilliant move from the club, to be honest. I think in, in terms of PR alone, and I think you're quite right. I don't I don't know what his job title is. I think you can just slap the word ambassador on it, can't you really? Handing out the Ferrero uh, Rocher, isn't he? Yeah, it's it's just, but it's a great move because he's he's the favourite face from, from you know from from most folks favourite town side in in, well, in living memory. And and you know as for players that want to have a pint with it, be, him and Alan Lee pretty much photo finish you know dead heat. But I've played tennis with him, so I've already like I've finished that dream. So if Michael's watching tennis elbow and fancy well, uh, and fancy yeah. fancy a pint, then I can I can I can tick them both off the list. But you know he, he harks it is perfect timing because he harks back to an era that we've that we've just lost and we feel disconnected with. Uh, and, and and he was the favourite face with his dressing gowns, etc., wasn't he? You know, mm. that was like people people would have taken a bullet for him at that point. You know, he got my I, I slept on the floor of Marseille Airport to come back and watch that town team with him in it play and get battered by West Ham the following day, just because everyone felt so connected. In fact, there's in fact on the HTSA website. There's a story about, well, one, me sleeping rough on the floor of Marcy Airport and two, me watching uh, the Udinese friendly from the red light district in uh, in Singapore. But it's not quite as bad as it sounds. But, uh, but there's, there is a, there's a lot of stuff on that site. But, um, but I no, think we need to discuss that in a bit more depth there, Cameron. Maybe that could be a podcast I, I'd rather people one. went onto the HTSA <laughs> website and saw the depth of information at their, uh, at their disposal and, and, and find out for themselves. It's that nice was a good somewhere. deflection, yeah. I'll give you that. Good but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite as exciting as it, as it, as it might have sounded from that snippet but uh, but 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 the half is just i think i think this is again like we were saying back at the start of the episode this is the beginning of the club starting to reconnect with the fans and yeah okay like it might be get the old boys back in etc but it's it it, it it is a smart move because it, it, it shows that they're tuned into the way that fans are thinking and there's been a lot of talk about about the disconnect over the last 18 months the last two years and so look the, the, those in behind the scenes 
there's a select number of people who can who can who can affect what's going on on the field, but there's far more people who are working out at the club who can't who can't sort out the football and have to deal with everything else on the side and 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 they can put out as much good content as they want. It doesn't necessarily mean the right lot if we get pan seven nil. So you know they're on a hiding to nothing. And so to do that and bring back Heffler, I think was a really good shout. And it's certainly it's a step in the right direction. And so I think if 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 we have a boring season and come twentieth again, but we start to get back towards that feeling, then I think we can take that as the biggest result, to be honest. And and Heffler is 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 the start. Is the start of that. You made a you made a really interesting point there, you know, about um, what's going on off the pitch and, and a, a, a key indicator of how well your your team is going to do. If you look in the in the offices and, and the people who are working behind the scenes for the Shield Town, if, if if that's a happy group, you'll generally see a, a, a well performing team on the pitch. And it's nothing to do with performances; it's about how well the club's being run and the people within it. Um, it's, it's you know Peter Jackson came into that club when I were there and, and it was a totally different place. He spoke to every single person in that club and they all felt like there was there was a worth there. Um, and I know managers who preceded him, it, it wasn't the same. Yeah, I think the key thing about that promotion season was definitely the unity that we all felt after a few seasons of mediocrity to Dross um, floating down the bottom end of the championship and Heff was obviously yeah. a, a big factor in that and I think that the fact that we recruited a few players from Germany that summer helped as well because they've come from a fan culture where there's an accountability you know there's a um, you know there, there has to be a connection between the players and the fans um, because the fans hold quite a lot of importance um, you know with the ultras groups and stuff so they came over and they set about establishing that connection obviously David Wagner fully understood how important that would be. We got the South stand, which was obviously a very big move as well. Um, and yeah, and Hef was was the embodiment of everything that it meant to support town at that time. Um, bringing him back now, I mean, I'll say one thing. It was low-hanging fruit, wasn't it? You know, it was, let's, let's, just, put, let's just bring him back in. He can do anything he wants and people are going to love it because it's Hef. Um, but apart from that, it's, just, it's, all, it's all positive, isn't it? He, he's... One of the most likable guys that I can remember in my time supporting town. It's a shame that he's had to cut his playing career short because of because of various injuries. But now, as you mentioned about him being a very serious guy, um, it, it sounds like he wants to go down either the coaching or the director route um, rather than you know becoming the new Terry the Terrier or anything like that. So I, I think that that's um, that's going to be the route that he goes down is is behind the desk or or something like that. But um, for the time being, we can just enjoy him being here. And we we you remember we, we've lost people at the club as well who uh, knew the importance of the connection, um, regardless of your opinions on him. Sean Jarvis was a, was a big part of that. Um, and then he left to go and, and start a new challenge at, at Leicestershire. Um, and he was one of those go-to, you know, sort of like a, a liaison. Um, so having F back, surely it can only be good, can't it? Sean would make a great Terry the Terrier. I'm sure he would. He's yeah. He's, he's definitely yeah. Uh, uh, Sean's candor is definitely missed. You know, he's uh, he was a great character around. Um, moving on from Michael Heffler, the third kit was launched with uh, a band called Flaws, who are a band I took notice of in about April. Um, they're very sort of you know I, I like indie music and they're a little bit soft indie. Um, I thought it was a great launch, really great launch, and an absolutely superb kit. You know, town. Kind of really knocked all three out of the park this year. I think uh, they've, they've done brilliantly. But this, I, th- I thought this was great, and I hope this kind of uh, ushers in a new era of how town approach social media in in some ways. I just thought this was different. Um, you know, I've not seen anybody really do this before, uh, and I, I quite enjoyed it. The Flaws are not a bad band either. You know, if they're on Spotify, if people want to check them out. Um, what did you guys think of the kit? I think the kit's great. You know, the the, the colours really fantastic. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna buy it. I don't usually buy kits because I'm a bit old now, but you know. Um, it'll look nice in you, Matt. Yeah, do you reckon? I'll have yeah, to get yeah. next time. I should put that snood on. We all got through the post, shouldn't I? And uh, wear that during the podcast. But um, yeah, uh, again, the the free gift. You know, we talk about the connection as well. We just mentioned the free gifts there in in passing. You know, my my little boy got. Uh, a backpack through, you know, uh, we a lot of people got snoods and wash bags, etc. But you know, he, he got a backpack through, which was which was really cool, actually. So the club are really sort of building those bridges, you know, reconnecting, and uh, it's good to see. But I thought the the kits kits fantastic, and you know, the the release video was decent too. It's a nice kit. 
Go on, yeah. No, I was just going to say it's a nice kit, but the the best thing about that was that they tried something different. You mm. know, with the with the home and the away kit, I, I get it. You know, right. it, you, you can't always come up with some revolutionary concept to launch a kit. Uh, but I remember the one where we did it, and they were Schindler and stuff posing in front of the old turnstiles, and I thought that was a nice launch. Yeah, Sometimes all you can do is plaster it on a graphic and say, "Here's our new home kit." But the production value of that third kit launch was absolutely fantastic. You know, the stadium at night with the drone flying in and it really made the kit pop. And then we, we talk about going back to our roots as a club and everything being promoted uh, um, about local things that we can celebrate from the local area. Yeah. And the flaws are that. And well, I think they're just flaws, sorry. Um, but like the Magic Rock and, and, and this kit launch, um, it's things that you know, people can actually for once get a little bit excited about and think, yeah, oh, maybe we are in good hands. And those are things that Sean Jarvis, you know, you mentioned Sean Jarvis and Sean Jarvis is very big on on the local firms as well, on the Huddersfield 100 and, and whatnot. So it's, it's good that the club are definitely doing that. Cam, what did you think? I just think, yeah, it well, three stonking kits for the first time, I think since the, probably well, probably the Premier League. Um, and, and yeah, curiously, I noticed that they're all blue, which is, I, I just, <laughs> I couldn't help but wonder and thinking, I'm sure that way back when, when, uh, when alternate kits were brought in, they were there to distinguish from one another. And I'm not complaining for complaining sake, because I love the kits. I think they're great, um, especially that third one. And you're right, the, the, the production value on it. It was, it was like nothing I've seen town attempt before. And I think they nailed it. I think they got it spot on. Um, and, so, and so on the PR side of things, like I hope this isn't just going to be until parents' evening we can slack off. You know, I want it to see it continuing <laughs> through the academic year. But, but, but first week back, it's been strong. Um, but yeah, it's just three blue kits, and and I'm just like dreaming up a scenario in my head. A la I was just thinking ten that. years ago when we got uh, we had back in the days where we we weren't big enough to have three kits, um, and we had what we had we had blue and white, didn't we? And then we had um, we had that like that. No, what was it? We had the we had the was it when we had the gold one? No, yeah. Oh, oh no! Yeah, I remember it. Uh, when that was, we had blue and white, and we had a black one, and then we drew like Grimsby and Grimsby, the JP yeah. Trophy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We had to like go out and get an emergency orange one. So orange I'm sort of dreaming up a scenario where we play a Blackburn or we get Wickham in Cup or something. <laughs> I was like thinking that. of Blackburn. And have to run down to Sports Direct and get a few more printed off in a different colour or something. But like, <laughs> you know, freakish incidents aside, I think they're three excellent kits, and I think that the releases, and again, linking to the community and and, and local values. I thought, yeah, strong. Can I just interject and say if anybody's listening who has that ginger one off shirt that we want, Grimsby, <laughs> yeah, he won't sell it to me, uh, but I will buy it off you because it's a missing piece in, in my collection. Yeah, I've been, I've been after that. Do you know, I, I did, I did ask someone about this. I think I, might, I tried to ask Luke Cowan, but I don't think he's, I don't think he, he managed to come back to me. But there's uh, the, when you used to uh, sign up to the Blue and White Foundation, you know, a long time ago, at one point they released, uh, a uh, an orange shirt as well like a kit i think they only did sort of 500 as well and when you bought i think this must have been around 2005 six somewhere around there and they did an orange kit then as well uh and I i've never never one. seen that is I that, that is, i thought it was the I same think, one because there was a really good discussion on twitter about it about i think it was six me months and, ago yeah lee and morris like, yeah, i think yeah and he, i think it was saying people saying like i, I feel like it were because we couldn't i think it's because we couldn't sell another kit because I think there was rules about it, you know, back in the days yeah. before kits were 60 quid and everyone had three of them. Um, it was, yeah, I'm sure that I don't think it was even like 500. I swear it were like, you could only be, if, you could only buy one if you were like a patron or, you know, mm. you, 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 I think, you, it, you, I think it's when you signed up for it, they, they sent you one. If you it was like a new right. sign up prize. Yeah, um, you know, you, yeah. Yeah. It's, and I was uh, already, I remember being a bit annoyed because I was already a member, so I couldn't, couldn't get one. So I, I you know, I've always wanted one since uh, then, but so if anyone has one, um, You've got three buyers <laughs> potentially <laughs> here, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start well, bidding going in the wardrobe, but, uh, but, but, but I didn't quite realise the uh, the gold mine it was worth until about six months oh, ago. I'll Name your price. Yeah. Well, I'll, be, I'll be buried <laughs> in it now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, right, so well done to uh, to everyone involved with the, the kit release. So the last, last piece of business we've got on the agenda is we saw uh, Tom Lee's come through the door and a couple go out. So I think... Ollie, what's interesting is you mentioned earlier that we seem to be stepping away from what we mentioned 12 months ago. Do you remember Lee Bromby sat there sort of saying, you know, it's going to be an exciting brand of football. We're going to bring in dynamic players, young players that we can sell on, et cetera. Uh, and we've gone a little bit of a different way. Obviously things happen and, you know, you change tact a little bit, so it's not a dig at anybody in particular. Um, but we've gone out this year and we've got Matty Pearson, who's a more industrial type center back. Uh, we've now brought in Tom Lees, uh, you know, Richard Keogh left, Richard Stearman left, you know, so it's left potentially a void for an experienced centre-back. 
So we've gone out and got Tom Lee's and a free. You know, he's played almost, two, I think, according to Wiki, which isn't always the most reliable. You know, he's played 249 games for Sheffield Wednesday, which will all have been at the second tier, which shows great experience. He's still only 30. Um, we asked Ben from the Wednesday week, I think it was, uh, what his opinions were. And he said uh, Tom Lee's was great when he first came in, but the last couple of years he's kind of gone off a bit. But that could be said for pretty much every Sheffield Wednesday player. So potentially town could reignite Tom Lee's uh, career. You know, he lives locally. He's another one who lives locally and wanted to play, you know, and play and live locally. Um, it seemed a shame for Roman Edmonds Green to go out. But when you think about, when I think about it sort of logically, I, I tend to think 40 games, you know, 30, 40 games for Romani next year at League One level in, you know, a rugged, you know, last year he had a couple of incidents where he was pushed off the ball a little bit easily. You know, he, he did quite well last year, but there are a couple of um, instances where he was nudged aside a little bit easier. There was a home game, wasn't there, where he got nudged off the ball and, yeah. and they scored, I think that, was it Wickham potentially? Um, but it was around around that time. But I think this this is this is a good move for him. And same for Romney Critchlow as well. They've both got decent moves there where they can go stake a claim and, and come back as better players. Matty Daly's gone to Hartlepool as well. And uh and Aldo Krasnicki today has gone to Falkirk. Uh he's someone who uh, has played in the B team and the, the under seventeens and can play as a def- centre back or a defensive midfielder and, and he plays for the Albania under twenty ones. Uh, what what do you guys think of Tom Lee's coming in? Uh, he's not known to be the, you know, the the guy that plays it out from the back per se. Um, decent signing, solid signing. I, it's to me, it just looks like a, a relatively solid signing. Um, not the most exciting to get you out of your seat, but functional, steady. Functional is the word, I think, really. And he's scored about as many goals for us as Danny Ward has in the last eight years, I guess you could say too. So, uh, I, 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 yeah, it's it wasn't it was it was one you think you look at you think. All right, you know, uh, at the stage of this w- of the window, we needed bodies through the door, um, and of course, we spoke about how Naby can be an absolute delight on his day, um, but but we can't have him as our leading light, and he's sure up. And so, someone with that number of games behind him, I think five hundred or senior appearances, it is now. Um, I think it can only be. A, I can think it can only be encouraging. I think it's someone okay who's not going to set the world alight, but has played at that level for as long as I can remember. Um and, and and so I think it just adds confidence. I think it just adds a little bit more now into that into into that area of the field. I don't think we're lacking there anymore now. I think we just needed bodies through the door at one point. And if you'd given me him to start the window, I don't know, I would have thought, well, maybe we've got a few times to weigh him a little bit higher. Um but no, I think that you can tell a lot from 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 an experienced player when when fans of the old club are saying, yeah, he could do a job on the day. That that fills me with a lot more confidence. And so and so, yeah, I'd sooner have gone for him than than, than tried our luck with a youngster. And so, and so, no, I'm I'm encouraged by what I see. And of course, that doesn't always work out. We saw what happened with Andy King. You know, you think someone who can easily cut it at the level or even higher, um, so you never quite know. But but it, it just means that okay, we've got Kerbin milling around. We've had fitness issues massively last season. It's another bum on a seat. And even if that's in the dugout, I think that's a good thing for now. Phil, tell us about the impact the likes of Steve Yates had with you, Effie Sodji. Uh, even Ian Hughes. So Ian Hughes might be a decent one to pick or Eddie Yards because uh, we saw a side of Eddie Yards as fans that we perhaps didn't didn't love. You know, he got injured, didn't play, etc. cetera. Um, but you've spoke really highly of Eddie Yards, haven't you? And the influence that he had in, you know, over you and the other players in the in the background. So Tom, could you see Tom Lee's being, uh, Eddie, you know, Eddie Yards to 2021? That might not be the best thing for... Uh, I think Tom. I think the the, the Steve Yates and Sodji and and and, and like Ian Hughes that, that I think that situation it was a it was a challenge for those players, you know they were they were already good players and and, and I think this comes down to what my thoughts are in terms of elite in terms of where's his head at. I, I'm hoping that he that he's not going to be on the same contract that he was at Chef Wednesday. Um, I, I want someone to come in and, and be hungry uh, to to do well and to kind of prove prove themselves and. And I'm glad you said he was only 30. I thought he was a bit older, actually. So um, I would hope that he's, he's he's obviously a new club and he wants to prove his worth. Uh, Steve uh, Steve Yates and, and players like that, Eddie Howards, they were they were fantastic because they'd been there, done that, but they they, they wanted to help and support. Eddie Howards was a little bit different because we, we were really struggling at that time, um, and and there was a lot of pressure on him to to kind of be the, like the leading figure. And he did struggle with injuries, but it wasn't him kind of tossing it off. He, he literally was injured, but his experience w- w- was vital. I mean, he, talking about players that couldn't get around the pitch, he, he, he really couldn't, but his reading of the game was was fantastic. And 
for me as a young keeper playing behind him, it was just easy because I knew I knew where he was going to be and, and, and the, the support was going to be there. Um, I think it's based on the character of the player and, and the situation that they are in at that time. Um, backs against the wall massively with Jacko, wasn't it? And Jacko literally picked the right players because those players, the characters, you're talking about people you'd like to go and sit and have a drink with. All, th- all three of those guys, you could literally have a right now out of them because Steve Yates was, it was such a funny fella. Um, it, it, it just looked so old. It, it looked like it could have been your granddad. I'm telling you, up close and personal, it was, it was ridiculous. But what a guy. And, and I have no idea what this, this, this fella's like from Chef Wednesday in terms of personality. Um, but it's going to be hard for him to get into the team because obviously they've got a couple of players there earmarked uh, for starting, I think, and um, he's going to have to prove himself. And I just hope he's not going to be one of those that's kind of right, I've been there, done that, I'm, I'm picking up some decent money, you know, 10, 15 grand, whatever it might be on, it might even be more, um, and just settle for, uh, what's he signed for, two years or one year? Two? I think it was two with an option, wasn't it? Yeah. This is what I mean. So I, I just hope it's not going to be one of those. But I, I do agree with what you've said about the young kids. I think it's a lot better for them to go out now. Um, so I, like Cameron said, I think it, it, the, the deal makes sense. It's a, it's a bum on seat. Um, but it just doesn't want to be that kind of, it's just enough. This guy's going to sit here. He's going to wait his turn. He's going to do all right. Because we don't want that. We want people to come in. You know, you know, Ollie mentioned there in terms of the, the style of the, of the play. Yes, I would 10 times prefer us to be a lot more solid at the back. Um, but we also need to be creative going forward. And um, and, and if, to, to be able to be creative going forward, you've got to have that kind of solidness at the back to be able to do so. So um, the more the merrier, really, at the back. But um, hopefully he's going to be a bit more positive than Steam and, uh, and, and, and Keo. Fingers crossed. But the thing is, you, you listen to Twitter, we've all got opinions about people, haven't we? You know, we, you know one person at Town Fan's going to talk about Naby Science. Oh, it's great. He's a threat up front, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, he, he has a few bad games, but, but generally he's all right. Next person's going to slate him. So I have, it makes me laugh when you see all these fans saying, oh, oh look after him for us, won't you? Mm. He's a great <laughs> lad. And then next one, oh, shite, get rid of him. Oh, like, you can't pass him all five yards. You know, you, you, if you're going to read Twitter and, and, and opinions, there's so many in there. And, it, and it's right. That's what I love about social media. There are so many opinions. A mate of mine was a lead fan. Oh, God, it's horrendous. And you have to mute people, don't you? But yeah, it's um, yeah, it, one of those. Wait to see. I said about uh, Keo and, and Steeman last time in terms of um, the the experience and how much are going to help, and it, <laughs> it didn't really turn out well. So let's uh, let's sit and wait. Eh? You, it oh. might surprise us. The, the best centre half could be the youngest kid we've got, mm. and it might be an yeah. absolute revelation. He might show experience above his age and canvas that people look up to an 18 year old you know what I mean it, it, that could be the case so who knows go on Ollie I'll let you have the last word on Tom Lee's uh, you know how I feel about it I moaned at you for, for the whole morning when we signed him <laughs> um, no nah, so I guess if I look at it objectively in terms of the transaction that happened obviously we've signed Tom Lee's on a on a free transfer two year deal and we've loaned Ramani Edmonds Green out to, to Rotherham so if you think that's one in one out and um I don't like I don't like that. Uh, to me, that just doesn't doesn't really stack up. I would much rather be giving any minutes that are available as a backup centre back um, to to somebody who's younger. Uh, you mentioned the hunger side of things. I think I think that's true as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, yes, Lee's has a lot of experience at this level, but he's never been regarded really as a as a very very solid and dependable centre back. I mean, blame Tom Lees was trending at one point during the season. Um, I think he's got a bit of a gaff in him sometimes, um, and I really hope that he proves me wrong there. But I just think that it, from a recruitment point of view, and everything that had the potential to to make this a good project under Corberan, now it, it's starting to just unravel a little bit, and we're just going for the for the easy pickups, and we're going for the unimaginative recruitment, um, and that that just doesn't quite sit right with me. Um, then at the same time, if I look objectively, uh, our def- our centre-back department overall has probably improved quite substantially from last season to this season. Uh, I think our depth options are far better. Um, we're younger overall, obviously, having, having shipped some players out. Um, I think uh, 
loan spell for Rahman. He's great at this age, crucial stage in his development. He's going to go to a Rotherham team where I think he will he will start games in a team that will, will probably finish in the top six. Um, or be, they'll be there or thereabouts again. Um, and then for, for Romani, obviously, he, he had to go out on loan. He, he needs the minutes. Um, he's still a, a bit more raw. Uh, and I think that he will definitely... Uh, definitely benefit from some playing time but yeah uh it's really hard to get excited about it in it you know that's the one thing i'll say about him i really hope that he proves me wrong but ultimately i don't really want us to be in a situation where he's starting a lot of games because that probably means we've got injuries or we've got suspensions or we've got covid or whatever it may be so I, yeah i just find it really hard to get excited about which which signing has excited you the most uh, interestingly I, I was really really hyped for colwell because I got a couple of friends who watch Chelsea's youth um, regularly, and they said that you're getting a, a serious player in My, life. Minus, minus him, because because I think we all got that, didn't we? I think we all kind of thought, you know, he's going to be a player because it, it's well known. I think with him, apart from him, who who else? Pearson Phil. I like Pearson though. Like a, I, I saw him described as a clogger, but like not in a in a <laughs> negative way. Like a, a, an old fashioned centre back who is going to, you know. Um, but I, I actually think that's a bit harsh. He, he, he seems to be a pretty well-rounded uh, defender. Question marks about him playing out the back, but um, I think with understanding that, that should hopefully improve. Um, apart from that, it, it, I, I think Sinani could be good because if we are going to play him in that more advanced midfield role, if we play a midfield three, then he could be the link player that we need mm-hmm. because Holmes... Holmes has been really hit and miss since he came back, to be totally honest. Um, and if Sinani does play as the more advanced to the midfield three, we could start to see something because there's a player there. Norwich haven't really got loads wrong with their recruitment. Obviously, he didn't really break through into their team at all, but why can't it work for us? Um, and uh, but, yeah, apart from that, I don't really know. I, I mean, Rhodes, I wanted to say Rhodes because like, it's going to be a romantic reunion and he's going to come back and score 20 goals. But I think realistically... We we know we have realistic expectations about uh, about where Rhodes is going to be at as a player now. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of signings that are backups, isn't it? Ruffles, Turton, and and that's when I'm just thinking the recruitment's this, a bit. Yeah, this is it, and I, and I think this is a problem because for me, we, we need a we, we we need to be excited for a striker. I really do. I think and and it's 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 non-existent, is it? Really, I think he'll do all right with Rhodes, but it's. I think we've missed a trick, really. Um, but yeah, we have three similar sort of, and that's why I don't think it quite. I mean, I think it was more about. I think it was more the ha- the, the, the thrown together squad, but I don't think mm. it quite worked with Rhodes and Ward because they, okay, they're different players, but they cut from the same cloth in the sense that yeah. those are him, and in a sense, Campbell, who okay, maybe offers a little bit more. Um, Maybe they're they're the, they're the three strikers you'd want alongside uh, your brighter talent, somebody who is going to get you the goals. And there's no, I think there's a risk saying that you've got three players there. You think I've got a chance to get into double figures, um, and you think okay, yeah, maybe one of them will. And if Rhodes, I, I I wrote that if Rhodes does do manage to get over ten, I think that's a really good return. I know he wants to get over his hundred. I think he needs is it thirteen? He needs to get over that now or something. Um, I don't think he'll do it in a season, but. But but yeah, that that's 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 the problem. I think there was there was no marquee name. We knew there were going to be. We knew there wasn't going to be anyway. Um, the one I got excited about was Sinani, just because we never. Had a, mm. Who can say they've got a Luxembourg international playing for a minute? You know what I mean? I have to get Luxembourg shit. Now. I think I think us four could play for Luxembourg probably if we, if we could find some kind of bloodline. Uh, I'm st- I'm still waiting for the Singapore selectors to come get me through me, grandma. Mate, yeah, but it sounds like you might be banned from Singapore. Oh well, well yeah. or arrested. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't think their scouts watch the Huddersfield Four. No, no, I don't think they can get in the call up anytime soon. I was trying to think. There used to be a Luxembourg international that played uh, in the football league. I can't, I'm just trying to remember who he played for. Was it? Uh, for some reason, I've got Darlington stuck in my head. But there used to be like a little winger. That played in the uh, in the football league, but I might have to dig that one out. But that was probably about 10, 15 years ago. I'm going, I'm quickly trying to Google it. So if anyone wants to fill in the gaps while I do this, please knock yourself out. No idea. Out. That is obscure. But- that- <laughs> you do pub quizzes, Matt. Can we like hide that? Is obscure. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've, I've got his a, name. A on Luxembourg this. winger for Darlington, fifteen years oh, ago. It's like, it's like Cameron says, you don't get many Luxembourg internationals. Nah. Do you? No, um, I mean, like we've had some some. When I say strange, I guess exotic internationals like Curacao and Montserrat and uh, stuff like that. But well, Malvin um, Kamara at Sierra Leone, didn't yeah. He? After, yeah, yeah, he had to go for a few qualifiers. Yeah, that. yeah. Mm. Oh, uh, I'll try and find that. I think the last um, 
the last note that I've got here is just to uh, try and get people to join our fantasy football league. So we've got an FPL league going. Uh, we've put uh, plenty of uh, uh, posts out on uh, social media. Uh, we're using Gaffer for a championship one as well. And I sit in 11th after half my team didn't play in the opening day of the season. I can't believe Fulham didn't pick Joe Bryan. I thought he'd be a shoe in for, you know, for that left back spot. But uh, yeah, join us. Uh, Magic Rocker will be putting some prizes up at the end of the season. I need to speak to them in the next week to decide exactly what they are, but I'm sure they'll be of an alcoholic nature. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> freebies, freebies, Phil. Get yourself signed up. So, oh, <laughs> so what about, think, that? What about um, I love the boo then involved in all the um, advertisement of that. The man, oh, who can't, uh, the man who can't handle a pint himself. And he's uh, <laughs> holding, holding half. He sort of must have drunk half of that pint for <laughs> That video was superb. I mean, he was strolling around like he owned the place. What right? a legend. Oh, it was great. I yeah. can't believe we were allowed out. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. You definitely didn't buy that pint, Phil, going from what no, everyone always says no, about Booth. Yeah. Not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. Slowly walking to the bar while you all go first. <laughs> yeah. uh, we love Booth. But yeah, so uh, sign up to that. Uh, thanks, Cameron, for, for joining in. Hopefully get you on a few more times uh, in the coming weeks, uh, Ollie, uh, same goes for you as well. Um, mm-hmm. If if you fancy uh, ever taking in any uh, Italian football, Ollie does a very good website called Sempre Milan for AC Milan, don't you, Ollie? So if you, if you, you exactly. That, so if you love your goal, that's similar. Yeah. <laughs> what a Sunday that we're watching that. Yeah. Oh, James, they've uh, Syria is back on BT and they've got James Richardson presenting oh, the show. Like so that would be absolutely amazing. Oh. I can't wait for that. Like the good old times. Everyone needs sit to there with right Corriera there. della Sport again and just, just sat when there Lukaku the news. leaves as well. I only watch it for Lukaku. <laughs> yeah, I, I I, I'm Chelsea, really so. happy. Really happy about that. As my Milan flag on there will testify. But yeah. Mm. As uh, team, as uh, two teams, so I was gonna say, yeah, I was gonna say two teams, so and so, <laughs> but anyway, thanks guys for coming on, thanks Phil again for coming on, and thanks for everybody for listening, sending in your thoughts, and hopefully, we'll be back live soon, uh, in the not too distant future. And thanks again for Magic Rock and their continued sponsorship. There's a team that is dear to its followers The colours are bright, blue and white They're a team of renown They're the pride of the town And the game of football is their delight And all while upon the field of play Thousands loudly cheer them on the way Often you can hear them say Who can be the town today? And then the bells will ring so merrily Every goal shall be a memory So town play up And bring that cup Back to Huddersfield So town play up And bring the cup Back to Huddersfield